Here at the Munich Security Conference, there's plenty of insecurity and conflict to worry the politicians and experts. So has the world reached a dangerous inflection point? My guest this week has decades of experience at the highest political levels in the US. She's California Congresswoman and former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. In Gaza, the US has warned that Israel has killed far too many Palestinians. But is Jerusalem listening? How will funding for Ukraine clear the current bloc in the US Congress? And is President Biden really too old to run for a second term? Nancy Pelosi, welcome to Conflict Zone. Conflict Zone. When you look at all the various conflicts that are in progress around at the moment and their capacity, their potential to spread, are we reaching a new and dangerous inflection point? Well, we have, but I think it, it, everything is an opportunity. Uh, I do think that people are starting to think, what is this about war? We cannot have innocent people, children, families, uh, being victims of war when they're not even combatants in it. So we have to find another way to resolve conflict, and uh, because it, this is just uncivilized and brutal. Well, let's talk about that area where innocents are being killed, in Gaza. Israel has been preparing its forces to fight in the southern city of Rafah, on the border with Egypt, where more than a million Palestinians have sought refuge from the war. Last week, the White House said it wouldn't support a military operation there and warned of a disaster if it went ahead. Mm. What should the U.S. do if Israel ignores that warning? Well, I, don't, I hope that there's some other place that Israel can go in terms of being careful about civilian life. They have made it clear that they want to rid Gaza of Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization. They commit an act of brutality, barbaric assault on Israel on October 7th. Uh, and following that, we see many children, families, grandmas uh, uh, suffering uh, from the consequences of their barbaric action. So when you say they want to go into the city, and, and now that city, I understand, has five, three to five times more people than it would normally have because there are so many refugees there. Uh, and we're saying we don't support that. Well, we haven't supported any of their aggression. We recognize Israel's right to protect itself, defend its borders and the rest. But uh, I would hope that they would hear the call of Secretary Blinken and, of course, President Joe Biden. All of, all of us are friends of Israel and be careful about the civilians. The, the White House has escalated its rhetoric pretty sharply last week. Um, Mr. Biden said Israel's conduct of the war was over the top. There are a lot of innocent people who are starving. He said there are a lot of innocent people who are in trouble and dying, and it's got to stop. Can Mr. Biden make it stop? Well, we have a, a I don't want to call him Mr. because I've lost so much respect for him, Netanyahu there who seems to be you've lost respect for him long time ago but nonetheless uh he seems to be calling the shots and he and his very extreme right wing i wouldn't even say conservative because that's a legitimate place to be in the world of thinking on the spectrum but right wing radical right wing uh, cabinet so i would hope that uh, hearing from a friend of israel as joe biden has always been and all of us have been that he would uh, respect the lives of the people who are innocent, collateral damage in this war. But there are levers that Biden could use, which he hasn't used. There are levers which previous presidents have used when Israel has, in their view, crossed the line. For example? Go back to 1956. Eisenhower oh, threatened six. sanctions if Israel didn't pull its forces out of Sinai. Um, Reagan, you know, um, held up delivery of fighter jets over Israel's action in Lebanon. George Bush Sr. blocked loan guarantees because of settlement building. He did. I was there the day that uh, that I, I, well, you're going back to 56. I mean, so these levers are there, aren't they? Well, there's some, but the president has 
uh, said something about uh, the, uh, the, the settlements. He has said something about the settlements. But saying and, and blocking uh, weapons supplies, for instance, well, are very different things, aren't well, they? Well, it's not. It's a path. It's a path. Look, this is terrible. I mean, uh, nobody wants to in any way um, minimize what happened on October 6th. This was barbaric. It was horrible. And the consequence of hostage taking, rape, murder, kidnapping, attacking young people at a music festival. How, how bad could it get? And, and almost to the point of inviting inviting a reaction. Now, none of us has any sympathy for what Israel has done to the, the uh, children and innocent people in this war. We have total sympathy for them, but we want the hostages released. We want Hamas addressed. And by addressed, I mean, if in fact they think that they can just prevail in Gaza and continue to be a threat to Israel, that is not an answer either. So the es it's a funny thing about war. People think if they start a hostility, they're going to end an injustice, but it usually just adds to further hostilities. But I guess my question is, at what point would you, a longtime friend of Israel, say to the government there, the price of this military operation is too high and is no longer morally defensible? Or are there no limits as far as you're concerned, no red lines? Well, uh, uh, why would they care if I said that? I mean, why well, if would you they don't, care? If you don't, you're staying silent and uh, you're no, complicit, are not saying silent. You? No, the we're not saying complicit. silent. We're saying it is, uh, it's, it, it's wrong for them to do what they're doing to the extent that they are doing it. Uh, you can understand if it were the Netherlands and someone came in and uh, killed you know, over a thousand people and kidnapped and brutally uh, harmed other people that you would want some justice done. But again, how that is calibrated has to be done with humanity. And that's what we have to return to is our humanity. But isn't, isn't the danger for the U.S. that if you don't like what Israel is doing, and the president has made it clear that some of what Israel is doing he doesn't like, that's right. and, and you go on supplying them with hardware to do those things, you own this operation every bit as much as they do, don't no, you? No, we don't. We don't. We have always supported Israel as our uh, national security friend, largely because it was in our interest to do so. At largely because it was in Jusa. We had shared values that only democracy uh, in the region. Uh, the, the behavior of Netanyahu is, in my view, inexcusable in terms of how it has affected the collateral damage to children and families and the rest. But nobody can take away the right of any country to defend itself that has been brutally attacked in that way. Uh, the uh, 28,000 Palestinian lives is more than self-defense, yeah. isn't it? It's more than self-defense. Well, their goal, is, and I just saw um, uh, President Herzog, who, for whom I have enormous respect, and uh, I said, how are, you know, how are things? And he basically said, we just have a couple more steps and then we'll be through this. So that sounded optim optimistic to me that they think that it is in reach to rid Gaza of Hamas. I don't hear a lot of the people, and they're outside my house almost every day, but nobody cares about that. And I don't mean to make that a big thing, but I just hear them uh, saying, free the hostages. I don't hear any of them saying Hamas is a terrorist organization. I hear them praising Hamas. I hear them ignoring the hostages. So there's a lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, behavior we all have to address here. Last week, the EU's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, wondered aloud why the US isn't doing more to have its warnings taken seriously in Jerusalem. If you believe, he said, that too many people are being killed, maybe you should provide fewer arms in order to prevent so many people being killed. He's got a point, hasn't he? The, Israel is very well equipped with weaponry. There's nothing that we have sent since October 7th that has, uh, has uh, contributed to this brutality. 
uh, in, in the longer run. It, they're in a dangerous neighborhood, and we will uh, continue to support Israel. Let's talk about Ukraine, if yeah. we may. $60 billion of U.S. funding for Ukraine has hit a roadblock in Congress. NATO Secretary General warned just before this conference here in Munich got underway that the effect of that delay is already being felt on the battlefield, and that means that lives are being lost. Do you think this roadblock in the House of Representatives can and will be lifted? Well, it has to be. I mean, it is... What if it can't? But it has to be. We just have to find a path. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, I speaker for eight years and leader for 12. So for 20 years, we had to find a path, and it wasn't always easy. I'll give you one example. I was completely, totally opposed to the war in Iraq. I thought it was uh, presented to the American people. It was misrepresented. There was no nuclear weapon. We, I was uh, 30, I'm 30 years on the Intelligence Committee as a member, as a top Democrat, and as a gang of eight and gang of four uh, at the highest level. There was no intelligence to support the threat, and yet they told the Congress and the American people the smoking gun may be a nuclear plume. So in any event, fast forward, I become speaker, and the, uh, our troops are there. We had resolution to stop the war X number at, on a certain date. The Senate had it as a goal. We had it as a, a insistence. And um, we were on a path to end our the war there. But the troops were still there. Mm -hmm. And so I had, I could not not fund the troops who are still there. And so we, as the top person opposing the war in Iraq in the House of Representatives, had sure, to but, sell to my members, mm. we want out. But while we're there, you're going to have to vote to fund the troops. You can't just say, I support the troops when it's easy and not hard. But and I gave them a path where some of them could and some of them couldn't, but we'd have enough to get the, the, uh, the job done. But it's hard. But you just have to make a decision to do it. When you make a decision to do it, you find a yeah, path. Yeah, but you're being blocked in, in Congress. In some places, Ukrainian soldiers on the front line are outnumbered five to one by Russian forces, and many forward units have no shells to fire. Yeah. Can you imagine the effect of this on, on Ukrainian morale? after the U.S. promised them, we will be with you as long as it takes. The well, promise is now yeah. we will be with you as long as it, we can. Well, be. you know what? Why don't you ask these change, questions of Donald Trump? Because he is the one, the puppeteer, who is shining the bright light on the strings that he's pulling other Republicans in the House of Representatives. But we have to get it done, and we have to find a path, and we have to negotiate, and we have to compromise. Now. On that score, I was the highest ranking first person to go to uh, Ukraine nearly uh, two years ago. And when we came back, the group that I brought were high level intelligence, armed services, foreign affairs, chairs, and that. And uh, we came back and we said, we want speed, we want distance, and we want power. And we have been asking for that ever since. Now we got more speed, more distance, more power, and there's still more that we need to send there. It's hard not to believe that if Ukraine had been given the tanks and missiles it now has, and the fighter jets that are on their way when they asked for them, they might have lost far fewer soldiers. Hasn't the West been far too scared of Moscow's nuclear saber rattling to give Ukraine the weapons it wanted? Well, I don't think the West has been scared. Uh, I think that um, uh, NATO and, and including the United States of America have acted in a very responsible way with great, with great respect for the courage and the de uh, democratic spirit of the people of Ukraine. But they drip-fed the supplies, didn't well, they? They, they? They wouldn't give them tanks well, they at had the beginning. Them, they they had, wouldn't they give them fighters. They had them what they had, and they have to continue uh, to make them. But uh, let me give you another personal story. Uh, when I was a girl, I was in school, and I went to the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. And in his speech, he said, I don't know if you were even born then, but in his speech, he said, uh, to the citizens of America, ask not what your country can do for you, 
but what you can do for your country. You remember that, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody in America knows that. They go to school. But for me, the very next sentence was what was important, too. To the citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. And that's what Joe Biden engaged in. No condescension about this is the American way. Let's do this together. And that relates to capacity. It relates to scope. It relates to time frame and the rest. And I think that they did a remarkable thing. This is a disgrace, what is happening in the Congress of the United States right now. We have to solve that problem. We have to get the job done. And you know what else we have to do? We have to If engage. it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. I don't believe it's too late. Not at all. Not at all. Russia has had two years to strengthen its military yeah, well, they, they and were to build up its they, war economy. They were going to win the first day. Remember that? They were going to walk in and rose petals and all that stuff? No, and it's not too late. I, in, in fact, put me in the corner of those who say, when people say, well, maybe they should negotiate. No. They should, it, they should do what the, Ukraine should do what they want to do. They can't go don't on fighting and dying children. forever, can yeah, they? No, but don't rape my women, kidnap my children, murder parents in front of their children or children in front of their parents, have brutality throughout the, using all of that personal brutality as a weapon of war, take land and then say, now let's negotiate. No, we have to win. Victory is the answer. And again, whether that means uh, making our weapons smarter in addition to more, having more boom power in addition to distance and speed, then we have to do it one way or another. But it has to be done because it's not just about democracy in Ukraine. That would be reason enough. God bless President Zelensky. God bless the people of Ukraine for their courage and their uh, determination and their, their strength. But we have to win. That, ha the, that victory must be soon. In the last few days, the head of Estonia's intelligence service has suggested Russia will now seek to double its military presence along its borders with Finland and yeah. the Baltic states and do everything, he said, to try to destabilize NATO's eastern flank. There's also been a whole spate of warnings that Russia will, over the next few years, attack a NATO country. Is NATO ready for such an attack? It isn't, well, is it? No, I, I think NATO is, but NATO doesn't want to have such an attack. It would be a brutal thing uh, to ha engage in a war between NATO and Russia. The important point is for us to help Ukraine win the war because, as you know, his appetite is insatiable. They, he's like, they, they said of, of uh, Catherine the Great that she carried her borders in her suitcase. Wherever she went, that's where Russia was. And that's what he's trying to, I think, replicate a few hundred years later. But NATO but, is fighting years of underfunding, years of neglect, years of... I don't uh, see that as... I, I don't... I, I running that, down its forces, its I, numbers. I, I, don't, I don't see it that way. Britain I think, can't even put a division of 10,000 fighting men into a, into a war theater. They don't have Well, they may not want to put them in a war theater. We haven't put people they may not want in the to. war theater. But the whole point is of NATO, isn't it, that they fight for each other. Yeah. But, uh, you know if they what, haven't I think got the troops, they can't do that. I want to rid you of your negative attitude in terms of this. Uh, this we have the resources. Russia is a big European army. NATO is, a, as I said, it was President Kennedy. What we can do working together, meaning making our decisions together, and collaboration and not condescension. And I think that we're poised to do that. I'm very proud of what America has done. I'm proud of what Europe has done. I think Europe has responded in a very uh, strong, positive way. Putin should take no joy in how he has been, this war has um, <clears throat> turned out. He was going to win in the first week or so, two years later. He's, he's now going into the third year of the war. One I don't have any doubt. I mean, I'm prayerful about it all. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we need prayers and we need weapons and, and we need courage. And I, I'm just, 
I, I, I mean, I've seen too much of it in terms of visits to our country, our visits there, my members going, and the rest. There are those in power in the House of Representatives who would hold this up. And that is a threat because they're, they wanted Donald Trump as their Speaker of the House. And essentially, they got him because he calls all the shots. Now, I didn't come over here to talk dem uh, politics, but when it comes to the policy of this, of having members of Congress, House, and Senate singing the praises of Putin have, because they're mimicking you know who, unless his name used to be president. Um, Donald Trump, the name you don't want to mention. It's like a foul word for me. You know, you know, like a curse word? When I was little, if you used a curse word, you would die and go to hell. That was the Catholic faith. Let, 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 let me ask you about these reports of uh, Russia readying a, a nuclear missile for space. U.S. intelligence has mm -hmm. just flagged that up. Have you been briefed on that? Yes. Russia has now denied it. How much credence do you give the report? Whether they are or not, <clears throat> We have to be ready for everything. Yes, I have been briefed on it. I've read this. Stuff. Is it serious? Well, is it a serious it, it, development? Well, it's, it, it's not a question of whether it's a development. It's a possibility. And we, we, peace and space is something that we thought was a given. But if it isn't, we have to be not surprised. Could this lead to a Cuban missile style showdown? Is that? What might be ahead? Some this? people think so. <clears throat> I hope not. Some no. informed people. No, I mean just chatter class. People who've been briefed by the intelligence <laughs> no, services. No, I'm just no? talking about people who read the stuff. They say, "Oh, it sounds like it could be," just as you asked the question. I'd like to talk briefly about Taiwan, China. Okay, you you sure. visited in I August did. 22. I you did. stirred up Beijing. There were no. aerial maritime incursions, ballistic mm -hmm. missile launches, cyber attacks. You think China will eventually invade Taiwan? I think if they, if they had the capacity, and that's what they would try to build to. But I think it's a, I think it's a convenient threat for them, a convenient threat. You don't think they'll do it? Oh, I don't put anything past them, especially she. But what does your it's gut tell you? Well, here's what I think about it. It's my head. It's not my gut. The, um, um, in the House and in the Senate, Democrats and Republicans are very strongly in support of Taiwan. We have our Taiwan, U.S. Uh, Taiwan Relations Act, which says that we support them in their as they defend themselves should, should they, in preparation for or should they be attacked. Uh, they have become a thriving democracy, a model to the world in terms of their economy, a uh, leading chip maker, uh, intellectual, inventive, entrepreneurial country, and we were not going to let them be ignored. Now, Would the U.S. fight for Taiwan if it was invaded? Uh, that's not for me to say. But we, we do, you have, know, do you know the answer I to know that? what our policy is. The our policy, policy is strategic is, ambiguity, but no, Biden came no, out and said he would defend He Taiwan. did, but, but uh, what we say is that we believe in the one China policy, so we're not saying independence, nor are they. They're not, maybe there's some people that are saying independence, but that's not the policy. We are supporting the one China policy, and for them, uh, the status quo. But what does it mean in the end? Would you, uh, the U.S. fight for Taiwan well, if it's Why do we keep about fighting? Let's try to find a no, path. But, but Let's try to find because, a path. Because China has said it will take it uh, eventually if, if it needs to use it capable of it. And if it's capable of it. Yeah. But let's just talk about China for a moment. Uh, China, uh, I have for more than 30 years, and that's why they were, you know, just a few... few a week or two before I went to China with my, our delegation, very high-level members of Congress, uh, praised by the Republicans in the Senate for going. So it was very bipartisan. But uh, just a week or two before, about four or five senators, bipartisan, went to Taiwan. Did you ever hear about that? No. They didn't say boo. They didn't say boo. 
and the high level chairman of the Wh of, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in the Red. But when I went, you see what they had to, because for 30 plus years, since Tiananmen Square, uh, pointing out the, the threat they are security wise with their proliferations of, pr proliferation of either weapons of mass destruction, technologies for weapons or delivery system for weapons of mass destruction, with their uh, trade policies and violation of mar market access principles or violation of, of uh, intellectual property, and of course, their uh, human rights violations, crushing people under tanks in Tiananmen Square, but not only that, crushing democracy in Hong Kong, cultural, the culture of Tibet, religion, faith, religion uh, language and culture in Tibet, uh, a genocide with Uyghurs. I mean, what is this? And then on top of that, they're doing uh, aggressiveness in the South China Sea and the rest. So there, there has to be, it's a big country, we're a big country. We have to deal with each other. We have to uh, work together to solve the climate crisis. So we have to work with them where we can. But we cannot ignore what they are doing, and we cannot uh, let them isolate Taiwan. OK, let's talk in the brief time we have left of, about the election year. An ABC Ipsos poll on the 11th of this month showed 86% of Americans now I think Joe Biden is too old to serve a second term. Are statistics like that causing major alarm bells to ring in your party? Joe Biden is a great president of the United States. He and Kamala Harris will be our candidates for president and vice president. He will be reelected president of the United States. Does it ever With 86% thinking he's question? too old? Well, what percentage thought that, think that Trump is too old? He's 78. What's he, 77, 78 years old? Uh, it'd be, well, Americans would prefer to have other people on the ballot. That's 67% of I respondents that, but said you're, that. You're talking about the two people who are likely to be on the ballot. So why are we just talking about Joe Biden? Joe Biden has wisdom, knowledge, judgment, a beautiful vision for America, knowledge of the issues. He's been there so long, a strategic thinker, a let master legislator, and that's all up here. And then in his heart, empathy for the American people. In well, the words of the special counsel who investigated his handling of classified documents, he was a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I think that that person should have just done his business. Charge or don't charge. We don't need you being a, a, a doing a, a doctor's analysis of, of something that you are so unfair about. In other words, there are other people that he that are part of that that he could have said they forgot. Do you remember everything that might have happened 20, 30 years ago? But the public perception is now that he is too old to run, doesn't it? You don't get away from this. Let me get back to your coming, question. This is coming let me from get the to polls. your question. Are you comfortable with that? Yes. I think Joe Biden is great. Just We are making a decision to win. We're doing everything to own the ground, to get out the vote, uh, to message, to inspire people to come to the polls and to have the money. Three M's, mobilization, own the ground, message, inspire, money, to pay for it all. And if you want an example, just look what happened last Tuesday in New York, in a district that Trump won by eight points, our candidate won by eight points, a swing of 16 points. Biden says that democracy itself is going to be on the ballot in November. It is. Is he right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, on, it's been on the ballot ever since what's-his-name ran in 2016. Donald Trump again. Yeah, your the friend, unmentionable. Your friend, the curse word. Um, the, um, the thought really terrifies you of him winning, doesn't it? Do you want to know why? Because think of democracy writ large at risk, praising Trump, Xi, Kim Jong-un in, uh, in North Korea and the rest. But yeah, it, it bothers me. But let's not talk that big way. Let's talk about the kitchen table. People are having their family discussion about their family planning, which is an economic issue. Take great pride in eliminated Roe v. Wade eliminating a woman's right to choose uh, her reproductive health. If you're LGBTQ, 
and all the other uh, initials that come after it, forget about your privacy. Do, do you fear a repeat performance of the insurrection that mm -hmm. happened around you January the 6th, 2021, if Trump loses but the election? It, well, we have... Uh, I would hope that a lesson would be learned by the people on the other side. They're using the defense of, well, I didn't know. I thought I was just going in the Capitol. Yeah, really, really. That was horrible. It was an assault. It was an assault on our Constitution, because that was a day to honor the Constitution in terms of accepting uh, the, uh, the... Joe Biden's victory. Certifying. Count of the uh, uh, certification of the Electoral College vote. It was an assault on our Congress so that we couldn't do our business. It was an assault on the capital of the United States. How fragile did U.S. democracy look that day? Well, as far as I was concerned, I said right from the start, they cannot prevail, and they will not prevail. And that's just the way it is. The obstacle to us getting rid of them was what's his name in the White House. I'll just use his name now, Trump. Trump would not send the National Guard and lies about it and says, oh, they, I was going to send it, but they wouldn't let me. No, he wouldn't send the National Guard. He sent these people. He gave them their marching orders. This is a very dangerous person for children and other living things. And if he but wins this time democracy. around? He's not going to win. He's not. He's ahead in the win. polls. No, he's not going to win. We ha this is our Valley Forge, or this is our Washington crossing the Delaware. We have to win. There is, everything is at stake. I'll close by saying this to you. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, where the national anthem was written. The national anthem, our national anthem. And when people sing the song, they have favorite places on it. My favorite line in it, proof through the night, that our flag was still there. Proof that, that's when I cheer at the ball game. Yay, our flag is still there. We have to make sure that our flag is there. there. So this is the proof through the night. We had a beautiful presidency. We are having a beautiful presidency of Joe Biden. Had it, I said had, because when we were in the majority, we were able to, to pass all these. Beautiful so we to have you, to win a lot. but with we, historic lows in the polls. Hmm? With historic lows. Let me get back to my point then. So 15 months ago, fighting for the flag to be still there, the pundits, the pundits and the polls and all this, uh, all this, uh, you got that? They were saying, you're going to lose 30 or 40 seats. You're going to owe an apology to the Democrats because you're using the wrong campaign. I said, we're not. We know exactly what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing. Oh, women's right to choose in a rear view mirror. Nobody cares about that anymore. I said, no, guns, women's right to choose, climate, and democracy. These people have voted against all of that. And we have a, a different message, and we're going to win. We won. We lost five yeah. seats in New York, mm -hmm. and that's how many were down. Now we're down to two. Now we're down to two. We are going to win the House. So that my point is, who cares what the polls say? Who cares? That we're going to lose 40 seats. We lost five. So what's that? Who even, you know, so, I, don't, I, don't, I don't worry about the polls. Okay. We don't agonize. We organize. We just have a will to win. And you know what? We just win, baby. Nancy Pelosi, thank you very much. You're welcome. For being You're welcome. Thank you.